Ladies and gentlemen, we're hoping to get started fairly soon, so if I could ask you to take your seats, please. We're hoping to get started. If you could take your seats, that would be much appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, we are nearly ready to start. If I could encourage you to take your seats, please. If you could all take your seats, it'd be much appreciated. We are nearly ready to get going. My name is uh, Scott Aiken. I'm the National Native American Liaison for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's an honor to be here today to open this celebration up with an honor song that my grandfather uh, had given me. And it's a song that is in Sac and Fox, one of the tribes that I'm affiliated with, but I'm enrolled, Prairie Band Potawatomi from Northeast Kansas. When I'm at home, my name is Maji, which means level with the ground. And I'm from the fish clan of my tribe, so appropriately that I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I ask you uh, in, in honor of this, if we could, though, to please stand. The song is a song specifically about the bald eagle, which is sacred to uh, many tribal nations and particularly to my tribe. And I'm a traditional dancer and singer uh, with the bald eagle as my um, connection. <clears throat> Yeah, 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 yeah
Miigwech, thank you very much. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Scott Aiken. That was wonderful. Maybe one more hand of applause for Scott. Thank you. <laughs> Secretary Deb Holland, Secretary General Yvonne Higuero, and distinguished guests, on behalf of the National Geographic Society, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to our base camp. We are thrilled to host the CITES Secretariat and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and all the partners here today. National Geographic celebrates the amazing efforts of the CITES Secretariat, global policymakers, and other wildlife advocates who make a difference for the planet and its inhabitants. We are so proud to have worked alongside you over the past five decades to advance wildlife conservation efforts around the globe. Throughout our 135-year history, we've dedicated to supporting wildlife in the ecosystems they call home. As an impact-driven nonprofit, we fund a global community of National Geographic explorers, scientists, conservationists, technologists, educators, and storytellers, who share our mission to illuminate and protect the wonder of the world. We've funded over 2,300 grants, totaling $61 million, with wildlife as the primary focus. Some of our grantees include the conservation trailblazers Jane Goodall and Jacques Cousteau, and changemakers like conservationist Paula Kuhumbu, and her important work to fight elephant poaching in Kenya, and photographer Joel Sartori, who through PhotoArc is documenting our world's astonishing animal diversity to raise awareness and inspire action. Our collective efforts create impact. 
like the investigative reporting by the National Geographic Society funded wildlife watch team who helped illuminate the need for stricter oversight of big cats and other threatened animal populations. And the Wildlife Watch team has two investigative reporters here uh, today in the audience, uh, Dinah Fine Marin and Rachel Fobar. So if we could give them a quick hand of applause. So copies of this magazine uh, were distributed to Congress. They, alongside many others, uh, raised awareness of this important cause, which led to a major victory for wildlife conservation with the passage of the Big Cat Public Safety Act just a few months ago. As we embark on another critical year for science and our planet, we celebrate the people and organizations in this room joining us virtually and around the world who are working to protect the great diversity of life on our planet. Thank you for being champions for wildlife. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Secretary General of CITES, Yvonne Higuero. Thank you, Mr. Miller and the entire National Geographic Society team for this beautiful venue to the United States for co-hosting and to Switzerland for their generous, generous financial support for this event. Madam Secretary, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on this day in 1973, a new convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora was agreed to address the worrying losses of wild species and of animals of plants due to overexploitation in the international wildlife trade. Today, we can proudly say there are 184 parties to this convention, almost universal membership. The still very relevant text of this international agreement was finalized here in Washington, DC, and so-called the Washington Convention. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you here today back where it all began. CITES is one of the oldest, most respected, and successful environmental agreements. Over 50 years, the text of the convention has lived, while implementation is fully adaptable to our changing times. The convention's strength is the constructive engagement of the signatory parties, who over the past half century have worked tirelessly to ensure that international wildlife trade is legal and sustainable. A special welcome to our party representatives in the audience today. And we are also happy today to commemorate the 10th anniversary since the establishment of World Wildlife Day by the United Nations Gen General Assembly back in, in, in 10 years ago. It was agreed to be celebrated on the day of signature of the treaty after a proposal from Thailand to celebrate the beauty and value of the planet's wildlife. Our theme for this 10th World Wildlife Day is Partnerships for Wildlife Conservation. CITES has achieved so much because of partnerships, bringing together governments, trade bodies, conservation groups, international organizations, and local communities all to ensure that the international wildlife trade does not threaten the existence of animals and plants in the wild for our planet and for our people. Today, we will show you what strong partnerships for wildlife conservation can achieve. We hope to inspire you to join us in whatever way you can to safeguard nature and to help build a new relationship that we need for the planet and for our own well-being. We are privileged to have with us speakers who represent significant partners for CITES. The US was a driving force in the creation of CITES, and we are so honored to have with us today the Secretary of the Interior, the Honorable Deb Halland. Secretary Deb Halland is an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Laguna in New Mexico. She made history when she became the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary. Throughout her career in public service, Secretary Halland has broken barriers and opened the doors of opportunity for future generations. She was elected one of the first Native American women to serve in Congress and was the first Native American woman to lead a state political party in the country. 
Secretary Haaland was raised in a military family and is an alumni of the University of New Mexico with both a BA and a JD. Please accompany me to warmly welcome Madam Secretary. Thank you. Great, I like the step. Hello everyone. I hope everyone's well today. Thank you so much, Scott, for that beautiful song and uh, we're proud to have him at the Fish and Wildlife Service and this isn't gonna be your last gig. <laughs> now that I know you sing. Uh, and thank you, Secretary General Ivan Higuero, for inviting me to kick off this really exciting day. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Washington, D.C. Happy World Wildlife Day. My name is Deb Holland, and I'm honored to serve as the 54th United States Secretary of the Interior. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today. It's amazing to be in this room with so many people who care about animals, birds, insects, plants, and the habitats the way that I do. Today, we celebrate an integral international agreement for protecting wildlife around the world, CITES. I will admit one of the very best parts of my job is seeing wildlife in their natural habitats. In January, I traveled to the Everglades National Park in South Florida. It was my first time experiencing this unique, vast, and delicate ecosystem. I saw how interconnected the animals and plants are with the habitats that sustain them. Our team even saw an American alligator. Well, actually, we saw several alligators, many alligators. They were all over the place during our visit. And as many of you know, at one time, these top predators were on the brink of extinction due to high demand for their hides and out of control hunting. But after being placed under federal protection of the Endangered Species Act, the American alligator is now considered one of our first ESA success stories. In fact, we've seen a lot of success stories result from thoughtful collaborative conservation work all over the world. I recently traveled to Australia to better understand our global partners' efforts to address growing threats from the climate crisis, from drought and vanishing biodiversity to worsening bushfire seasons. While there, I spent some quality time with koalas, which were nearly pushed to extinction during the devastating bushfires of 2019 and 2020. I learned that koalas greet one another by touching noses and I actually had the chance to touch noses with a koala. It was truly an experience that I will never forget. Today, these iconic critters are rebounding thanks to the collaborative efforts of Australia and First Nations people there. These success stories should encourage all of us. Yet despite these victories, everyone in this room knows that we're at a critical turning point. As the climate crisis worsens and precious biodiversity slips away, protecting and effectively implementing bedrock conservation measures like CITES and the ESA are more important than ever before. We can honor their 50th anniversary by keeping the next 50 years in mind because we have an obligation to our world and together we can build a future in which we respect nature, restore balance to our environments and value every living creature on this planet. That's the way I was raised. My grandparents and parents taught me how, to, how valuable nature is to our survival and to our spirits. Without nature, we have nothing. So we must live up to our responsibilities as inhabitants of this planet and take care of it. It's part of being a good ancestor to those who come after us. It's a responsibility that I take personally and that President Biden is acting on. Through the President's historic bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act, Interior is proudly leading transformational efforts that place the enforcement of CITES and the ESA, as well as collaborative and indigenous-led conservation front and center. At the core of this work is the America the Beautiful Initiative, a decade-long challenge to conserve, connect, and restore 30% of our lands and waters by 2030 
through voluntary and locally led conservation. To help meet this goal, the United States is leveraging an essential yet globally underutilized tool to address our climate and biodiversity crisis, indigenous knowledge. When we think about indigenous communities, we must acknowledge that they have spent generations over many centuries observing the seasons, tracking wildlife migration patterns, and fully comprehending our role in the delicate balance of this earth. That valuable knowledge can help us meet the challenges we face. Part of the way we put that experience into action is through the co-stewardship of our public lands and sacred spaces with tribal nations. Already, our administration has finalized more than 20 co-stewardship agreements with tribes and help advance our conservation and sovereignty goals with more on the way. That includes our announcement of reacquisition of 465 acres at Phones Cliff, a site on the east coast of Virginia that is sacred to the Rappahannock tribe. I had the honor of celebrating this acquisition with Chief Ann Richardson, the tribe's leader, as we explored their ancestral homelands. While eagles soared overhead, she described how meaningful it would be for the tribe to share their indigenous knowledge and storied history with people of our country. Through the agreement, the tribe will draw on its indigenous knowledge and practices to educate the next generation of stewards and to better manage the area's habitat, which is a globally significant nesting location for resident and migratory bald eagles. Partnerships like these will be essential for reaching our shared climate and conservation goals, but we know we must do more to place indigenous knowledge at the center of our work. And that is why today I'm pleased to announce that the department is taking new steps to advance restoration of one of our most revered species and the ecosystem upon which it relies, the American bison and the prairie grasslands. Through a new secretary's order and more than $25 million in funding from the Inflation Reduction Act, the department is committing work to collaborate, to, collaborative, to work collaboratively with tribes, states, and stakeholders to restore wild and healthy populations of bison. This includes prioritizing opportunities to restore bison on tribal lands, to advance coast stewardship opportunities, and to invest in the prairie grassland ecosystem, a shared system that stretches from Mexico to Canada. The health of bison is essential to the health of our grasslands and to the tribes who rely on them. This holistic effort will ensure that this powerful, sacred animal is reconnected to its natural habitat and the original stewards who know best how to care for it. This initiative is one piece of our new restoration and resilience framework, which the department is publishing today. The framework anchored by core restoration and resilience goals will guide the department's implementation of the extraordinary $2 billion in investments generated by President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. By addressing climate change impacts, restoring lands and waters, and improving the quality of life for communities, the framework will ensure these monumental investments are put into the best possible use. I am so excited about what it means for the next 50 years of conservation as we evolve with the world around us. We must think collaboratively and creatively. We must recognize the urgency of the climate and biodiversity crises, and we must elevate every single voice for the benefit of us all. I know there are many young people here in the audience and online today, and I want you to know that I'm honored to be in this effort right alongside you. As our next generation of stewards, you are already making a difference. Your dedication, your commitment to protecting our planet and its irreplaceable wildlife, that's what will help guide us through the next 50 years of progress. Thank you to everyone here for your steadfast dedication to protecting our planet. Thank you to the Fish and Wildlife Service Director, Martha Williams, and her entire team for, for everything they do. 
uh, but mostly for their relentless commitment to carrying out our conservation vision. Thank you for welcoming me here today, and I hope you really enjoy the rest of the program. And again, happy World Wildlife Day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary, for your presence and the unwavering support of the United States of America. The depository government for our treaty is Switzerland, a strong supporter of the convention. And I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Matthias Lorscher, who is deeply committed to CITES as a representative of the Swiss government and also as the very dedicated chair of the Animals Committee. Mr. Lorscher, the floor is yours. Well, happy birthday to everyone, to CITES, to World Wildlife Day. Mr. Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Secretary General of CITES, distinguished guests, it is a great honor to be able to join you here in Washington, the birthplace of the CITES Convention. With the adoption of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora on the 3rd March 1973, 50 years ago, a very important step in ensuring that international trade does not threaten the species survival was taken. Please accept, Mr. Secretary of the Interior, my sincere appreciation for the big involvement and devotion over 50 years that the United States of America have shown to this outstanding legal in instrument. Also, thank you to the uh, National Geographic for hosting this event here. Since 1973, our convention has taken major steps towards achieving its goals, which are international trade in wild fauna and flora is legal, sustainable, and traceable. CITES has created an integrated set of rules and processes which aim to support parties to the convention to achieve these goals. And this brings us to the very theme of this year's World Wildlife Day which is Partnerships for Wildlife Conservation. CITES aims to take its decisions based on sound scientific facts. We are therefore dependent on strong partnerships with scientifically based institutions such as IUCN or WCMC, but we also rely on vast knowledge from the trade and the NGO communities we all have large amounts of data and knowledge we can use in our deliberations and in our decision making. We also have strong partnerships with Interpol, UNODC and other organizations involved in combating illegal trade in wildlife, a major threat to our wildlife today. One further partnership we still need to strengthen has been identified by the recent assessment on the sustainable use of wild species performed by IPES the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It is indigenous people and local communities which are often the guardians of the wildlife we aim to protect with CITES, and who should benefit from the sustainable use and the protection of this wildlife. Important steps to achieve this have been taken to strengthen this partnership at the last conference of the parties, COP19, in Panama in 2022. The role of the CITES Secretariat in implementing and making the convention work and foster partnerships on all levels cannot be valued high enough. With the expertise, the leadership and the high competence of its staff, the Secretariat plays an invaluable role in achieving the goals of the Convention as well as moving it forward. Please, Mr. Secretary General, dear Yvonne, convey our profound appreciation to your staff. The list I just mentioned of partnership is far from exhaustive. Each and every partnership within this convention plays a vital part in making CITES what it is today, a convention known for having effective mechanisms that have a real impact. 
It thus contributes significantly to the SDG goal number 15, amongst others, as well as to the newly adopted Kunmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Switzerland is very proud not only to be a party, but the depository as well as the host of the Secretariat in Geneva. And I just want to stress that we want to give our continuing support to the Convention to support its work in cash and in kind. Mr. Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues, I thank you all for your deepest commitment and, on a personal note, I am honored to serve the ever-growing CITES community in the capacity as chair of the Animals Committee and to represent Switzerland with its different roles in the Convention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lorcher. CITES is lucky indeed to benefit from your expertise and commitment, and we are grateful to the Swiss government for its generous support. I will take your message back to my team, which really serves the convention with complete and full dedication. Now I'm pleased to be able to turn to a long-standing and important partner for CITES. The World Bank contributes financially and substantively to a range of wildlife and conservation programs and is one of five organizations, along with the CITES Secretariat, that form the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime. I am pleased to introduce to you the Vice President of Sustainable Development, Mr. Jorgen Vogele. Mr. Vogele, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning everybody. It's great to connect with all of you this morning around this hugely important topic and thank you for inviting the World Bank. As you said, we have been a very committed partner to CITES and this agenda for a number of years and I can assure you we will be even more committed going forward because it's becoming very, very clear that the issues we are trying to address are no longer you know, a want to have, it's a must have. We must get on top of nature degradation. We must get on top of biodiversity loss. We must get on top of ecosystems degradation because it's impacting everyone. It's impacting every individual, every community, every society, every country around the world. It's no longer just the elephants and the tigers and the alligators as the secretary pointed out. And it's not getting better. Yes, we have successes to celebrate. This is a day for celebration and you should be proud of what has been achieved but a lot is still going on that is going in the wrong direction. And we need to find ways, I believe, as a global community to do more, and that means also to put more money behind it. I think this is always at the end of the day part of the, you know, the, the, the big conversation to have. And we are really getting more creative around this. So one area which hasn't been mentioned yet is the private sector around the world. Increasingly, private companies, private individuals want to do something for biodiversity conservation and protecting species, but they don't know how, frankly. And they also want to make sure that they have a financial return. So at the World Bank and together with others, we're getting more and more creative. You know, we issue about 40 to 50 billion US dollars worth of bonds every year. I don't know whether many in the room would know that, in order to finance our engagement in developing countries for development programs. And we have now started to do sustainability type bonds. And we want to expand this to the maximum extent we can, whether it's climate, whether it's nature, you know, whether it's uh, fisheries and wildlife more broadly. We've just done um, a wildlife conservation bond in, in Africa that actually rewards if the investors, if the number of rhinos in two parks will actually go up over the next few years, the investors will get a small premium for their investment into the bond. They, they don't get a coupon, they get no money whatsoever in the process, only if and when individually and independently verified after several years, the rhino numbers have gone up. And meanwhile, we invest in the wildlife service in, in these countries to help them achieve that. But the combination of those three factors basically then you know, unleashes or unlocks a lot of financing that otherwise wouldn't go into that space. So this is a $250 million bond. Frankly, the potential is unlimited if we get creative. We are now in conversations with other countries, other can be individual species, can be broader biodiversity, ecosystem service outcomes. I think there is no limit, frankly, to where we can take this if we do this right. And I think that's something we also hope to get your support. How do we, how do we move this forward? 
um, we have as an institution in the last two years completely transformed ourselves with regard to climate change because it had become very, very clear that climate is impacting everyone, just like the biodiversity crisis. Growth is declining, particularly in the poorest countries. People are being hurt. So we've introduced a new diagnostic tool, not just the economics. This is about actually understanding how does climate impact the country? What does the country need to do to adapt and be, become resilient against the onslaught of climate change? And what can we as an institution do to support them? It's very deliberate, it's very focused, it's very strategic, and it's very systematic. And I believe going forward, we need to do the same with nature. You know, we, we were in Montreal uh, in, in December, fully supportive of the convention. And yes, the 3030 is a huge success and every, congratulate everybody to it, but the other 70% also matters. It's not just the 30, it's the 70. We need to get to a point, in my view, where everything we do, every road we build, every investment we make in agriculture, everything we do in the real world has to become nature positive. We can no longer just leave that sort of among other things and you know, congratulate ourselves on, on, on individual achievements. It has to become part of the DNA. And I can assure you in, the, in, a, in this institution, regardless of what you sometimes read in the newspaper, we have hundreds of people working on this to try to get to the point where we can engage with our clients in a way that allows them to grow because you cannot you know, you cannot get yourself out of poverty if you don't grow. But it cannot be the growth of the past. It has to be green growth. It has to be the type of growth that's nature positive, that it takes all these issues into consideration that you also deeply care about. And this is, this is the future. This is where it's going. And I, you know, I've been at the World Bank for 32 years. And <laughs> I, I know, sorry, yeah. <clears throat> it's been a while. But these last two years have been the most exciting of my, of my career and, and, and time in this institution. Because we are changing the way we look at development, the way we look at growth, the way we look at in, in engaging with communities that so deeply and, and incredibly depend on, on these um, ecosystem services. So let me uh, leave it at that, but just um, again, congratulations of what you have achieved with CITES. It's more important than ever. There's still $10 trillion worth of damage being done every year or around about that. I think it's still in that ballpark. It's way too much. More can be done and we will be a part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vogel, for this inspiring words and also bringing to our attention the issue of financing, which we will be discussing a little bit later with the knowledge that some of the latest studies say that it will take more than $700 billion a year to be able to halt and the loss of biodiversity and restore biodiversity. There's just not enough funds in the public sector to be able to cover that. We must reach out to the private sector and to private, private money. So. It has been a treat for us to be inspired by all these speeches and get this event started. Thank you so much. It has been a true honor to have Madam Secretary here, Matthias Lordscher and Jürgen Vergerlei for here today to be able to open this celebration of the 50 years of CITES and also the 10th year of World Wildlife Day. I wish you could please accompany me in a clapping an applause for our speakers today. Thank you very much. Partnerships underpin all effective work and this event is no different. It is a product of the efforts of six partner organizations, our hosts here in the United States of America, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Geographic Society, the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, IFA, Jackson Wild and the CITI Secretariat. IFA has brought us some beautiful artwork, more than 1,100 entries from people, young people in 80 countries. Those of you here will have seen, uh, seen some of it as you have walked in. Those of you watching on live stream will see some of this later. We will also be showcasing some of the best wildlife filmmakers and their films throughout the event and discussing the power of film in conservation. That's courtesy of Jackson Wild. So to start us off, start us off today, here's an excerpt from the first of our showcase films. First video, please, there we go. The 
ありがとう。卒業後一時で、一生懸命行くシーン。半分アップにあえて、一生懸命行<音楽> About 50 kilometers from Udaipur, a bird village tells us a unique story of hope and love. Minar is not a reserved bird area, yet its avian residents thrive alongside its humans. Thousands of resident and migratory birds feel secure, even in the heart of a bustling village. The reason are the Minarias, the local people of Minar. These passionate bird lovers call themselves Pakshi Mitra. Of friends of birds. Menar ne sadiyon se is water body ko saheja hua hai. Yaha hunting nahi hoti hai, shikar kisi prakar ka nahi hota. Khud nahi karte. Bahar ke koi log aate hai, to Menar ka itna dar hai ki wo yaha shikar kar nahi paate hai. The Pakshi Mitra have been trained on bird behavior by the forest department and given binoculars to help them protect the birds. यहाँ की जो चिड़ियाँ थीं हम बचपन में जब तालाब में नहाया करते थे सारे काले काले birds नजर आते थे हमें लेकिन अब जब मैं इनको देखने लगा हूँ इनकी activities को watch करने लगा हूँ पहले हम लगता था कि पूरा तालाब बदकों से भरा हुआ है अब लगता है कि यहाँ पे बदकों में पेलिकन से फ्लेमिंगो से नॉर्दर्न शावलर है नॉर्दर्न पिन टेल है यहाँ पे कॉमन कोर्ट से ग्रेड क्रेस्टेड ग्रीब है ग्रे ले गीज है बार हेडेड गीज है तो डिफरेंट डिफरेंट नेम सब आते हैं उनके नाम जानते हैं उनकी चौच को देखते हैं उनके पैरों को देखते हैं मज़ा आता है दिलेजर्स डू नॉट यूज वाटर फ्रॉम द लेक्स एंड पॉन्स फॉर इरीगेशन मेंटेनिंग अ कंसिस्टेंट वाटर लेवल थ्रू द ईयर सुबह शाम तालाब के इर्द गिर्द हम पेट्रोलिंग करते ही हैं धन तालाब है इसमें पहले खेती करते थे लेकिन जो यहाँ के बुजुर्ग हैं उन्होंने इन पक्षियों के लिए वो खेती का ठेका देना भी बंद कर दिया उससे इनकम होती थी गांव को वो भी इनके लिए छोड़ दिया टू इंश्योर प्लेंटी ऑफ फूड फॉर द बर्ड्स द एल्डर्स ऑफ मिनार है फिशिंग का आज दिन तक कभी यहाँ पर ठेका नहीं दिया गया है मछलियों का कभी कोई यहाँ पर ठेका नहीं दिया गया तो पक्षियों के लिए वो बहुत ज़्यादा अच्छा है फ्रॉम टाइम टू टाइम द बर्ड्स ऑल्सो रिवॉर्ड द विलेजर्स फॉर देयर लव एंड फ्रेंडशिप पिछले साल की एक घटना है कॉमन क्रेन्स आते हैं अपने यहाँ कॉमन क्रेन का खाना क्या है आसपास के खेतों में जाएंगे चने के खेतों में और उनके वो जो शूट्स होते हैं उनको खाते हैं तो पिछले साल ये हुआ कि कॉमन क्रेन ने वो शूट्स खा लिए अब वो किसान रोने लगा यार कि मेरे चने सारे खा गए लेकिन उनके खाने से उनकी जो फुटान थी वो और ज़्यादा हो गई तो उस साल उसका प्रोडक्शन अच्छा हुआ था इस साल मुझे वो पूछ रहा था किसान कि यार भाई वो वो अपने क्रेन कब आ रहे इस साल Birds of Minar are its pride, and the Minarias have set a fine example for their neighbors. इसे दूसरे आसपास के गांव वालों को भी सीखने को मिल रहा है कि किस तरह से मिनार ने नाम कमाया है पक्षियों की वजह से. तो वो चाहते कि हमारे यहाँ भी पक्षी आए. तो अगर वो चाहेंगे पक्षी आए, तो वो पानी को बचाएंगे और पानी को बचाएंगे तो निश्चित रूप से बायोडायवर्सिटी बढ़ेगी. There will be more of these beautiful videos throughout the program, inspiring us with the, their stories. And we're going to have now some more storytelling. 
we will be taking you on a round-the-world trip to hear from some of those who are involved in partnership projects that are having a real impact on conservation. I am joined by four people who are here to tell you about the partnerships for wildlife conservation that they have been engaged in. Let me first introduce Ms. Christy Plott. Ms. Plott is from the Louisiana Alligator Advisory Council here in the United States, and she will tell us a story of how caring for alligators can bring benefits you would not have ever, ever dreamed of. Ms. Plott, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. I'm Christy. Thank you so much for being here, guys. It is such an honor to tell you this story of partnership. This year, as we celebrate partnerships, I'm honored to tell you about this partnership that has led to the recovery of one of the first species listed in CITES, the American alligator. The story of the alligator's recovery began in the 1960s, when at that time, there were less than 100,000 animals in the wild. In 1962, Louisiana closed the alligator hunting season with the mindset of creating a program that would recover alligators and find a way to incentivize landowners and local people to conserve habitats and species. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife worked alongside Louisiana to assist and to provide guidance for regulation, management, and oversight. And in 1973, CITES was formed, which fortified and gave an international framework to this type of partnership. This was the foundation of a partnership that would bring the alligator to five to six million animals in the wild today. It is a true success story, absolutely unbelievable. Today, alligators are one of the most highly regulated forms of wildlife trade in the world, to include not only a permitting process, but to also include serialized tag numbers on every single hide that enters the commercial market. Crocodilians are also one of the most highly and widely traded species within CITES, and we are one of the most compliant. As a matter of fact, on American alligator leather goods re-entering the United States from overseas manufacture, less than 1% of those would fall into the category of illegal trade, most of which are due to clerical or paperwork errors. So how did they do it? That's what everybody always wants to know. So Louisiana, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and CITES fostered a relationship between government, science, and industry. I sort of think of it as like a trifecta. And today, the program thrives and the industry thrives, and commercial illegal trade with any detriment to species is virtually non-existent. So the partnership works in a unique way. Every year, Louisiana Department of Wildlife performs aerial nest surveys of the marsh. And with these nest surveys, the department sets quotas for egg collection and wild harvest. And landowners are able to sell eggs to alligator farmers thus bringing needed revenue to their businesses and to their properties so that they can work on basically doing um, restoration projects. So wetlands today are the fastest disappearing e ecosystem on the planet. As a matter of fact, the United States has Louisiana, which is the largest land mass of wetlands in the country, and 80% of those wetlands are privately owned. So that income from alligator eggs is massively important to restoration to our, uh, to our wetlands. And those wetlands are also home to 8,000 other species of plants and animals, making that revenue more necessary than ever. Farmers who care for and raise the alligators to the sustainable trade of meat and leather must release, by law, a certain percentage of juvenile alligators, healthy juvenile alligators, I'll note, back to the original landowner's property, which helps make thriving populations of American alligators. There's other benefits to this industry as well, too. This industry provides over $250 million a year in economic impact to the state's local communities and businesses. The Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries Management Program, which employs 15 full-time staff, biologists, technicians, 
and data entry specialists is completely paid for by tag fees from the industry, not by taxpayers. There's a high level of tolerance to the public because alligators and, and the industry for alligators provides numerous financial and conservation benefits throughout the entire community. And so there is a high public tolerance for living alongside alligators. As a matter of fact, in Louisiana, there are almost five million people and more than three million alligators living side by side. There are other unique partnerships which has contributed to the success of this program, one of which is the IUCN Crocodile Specialist Group, which is a true partnership representing all stakeholders of scientists, industry members, government, and even some NGOs. And it is the largest of all the specialist groups within the IUCN, which is quite unique. Another partner for this success are luxury brands. Luxury brands today demand traceability, transparency, sustainability, and accountability in their supply chains. And without the partnership of luxury brands, the success of this program would not be possible. So in closing, partnership is at the core of why the American Alligator has been rebounded. And why partnership is so important is because this model in Louisiana has been replicated around the world to recover other species of crocodilians. There are 27 species of crocodilians still in existence today, and the world's most secure populations are ones where wild animals are used sustainably for the harvest of meat and hides. In the last 50 years, CITES has played a critical and pivotal role in the success of these programs. So it has recovered not only the American alligator, but thousands of other species of plants and animals. And this is something we should all celebrate and embrace. I'd like to say a very special thank you to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, especially for all of your hard work. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to CITES for all of your hard work. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Plott, and for telling us a story that lets us see how, by taking care of one species, you can multiply benefits at all levels and for various sectors of society. Now I would like to introduce Ms. Eli Hamunela, who is director, a director in the Ministry of Environment and Tourism for Namibia. She represents her country at CITES, and she is here to share their experiences and outcomes when government and local communities work together for conservation. Ms. Eli. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've been introduced already, and thank you very much, Yvonne, for that introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here today to celebrate the 50th CITES anniversary, as well as the World Wildlife Day with you. For the benefit of those who do not know where Namibia is, Namibia is a country highlighted in yellow in that map. It covers the land surface area of over 8,200 and 23 um, square kilometers, and it's mostly an arid country. Its population is 2.5 million. As the setting of my story today is that we are living in an era where we are experiencing drastic wildlife losses. And of course, this is due to a lot of factors but one of the main factors, which is also a very big mistake in conservation, is that most of the conservation efforts, they tend to separate people and wildlife. But in reality, as we are all aware, people and wildlife coexist, especially in the rural areas. And these are the people who are bearing the brand of living with wildlife. And because of this separation, wildlife is regarded by some as um, government or state assets, and that is not ideal for conservation. 
In the 1970s, commercial poaching started in Africa, and unfortunately, Namibia was also not spared. By the 1980s, we lost our wildlife population drastically. There were some drastic declines. But today, I'm honored to be standing here to tell you one of the most successful wildlife um, recovery, uh, wildlife recovery story from Africa, Namibia specifically. We became independent in 1990, and in the same year, conservation and specifically sustainable utilization of wildlife resources for the present and the future generation, that's for the benefit of the present and the future generation, was written in our constitution, as I said. And because of that, government then had an opportunity to enact a law which, ena which en it's an enabling factor for a partnership between government and our local communities to manage wildlife resources outside formal protected areas through a program called Community-Based Natural Resource Management Program. Through this program, our local communities are benefiting from wildlife through photographic tourism and sustainable conservation hunting. And these two are very key, namely sustainable conservation hunting and photographic tourism. They are very key to this successful program. And if we remove one of the two, then this program will collapse. The program has resulted in some very good results. Um, we, um, at the moment, we have secured an additional 20% of our country's land surface area under conservation, and it's because of this program. And this is in addition to the formal protected areas which are on our state land. We have also um, noted a very good recovery of our black rhino population. Um, from less than 500 animals in the 1990s to over 2,000 animals as we are speaking. And that is now the largest black rhino population in the whole world. We have also seen through this uh, partnership an increase in the number of free roaming lion, lions um, outside the former protected areas. These lions are living with our local communities. Our elephant population has also benefited from the partnership. It has increased um, from 7,500 animals in 1995 to over 24,000 animals as we are speaking today. And these are all CITES listed species. Um, now I'm going to show you a clip, a video clip of our chief talking on the importance of this partnership, because this partnership is not only important to government, but it's also very important to our local communities. Please focus on the subtitles, as you will not understand the language. <laughs> Mwaifana hape mboshe, ileta hapa zinaza kare kare, akakushina mfiri fili muka tika jichaba na zipa waka kulipa ya chikaga wana huka ntu. Kukuta so kutee kutisi kare ulio kutee kwa huwa trophy hunting isha viko. Mokuwa na haro kutee na zipa unezo, baga nchoku teka zishiji wa mbozi hingihe, mi avantu kashaka ba wane nako yo kiliminero oru waru wavo, kapo kulele ngombeza wavo, mbozi mani kupangwa destroy zon she. In conclusion, in Namibia, we have a very pragmatic approach to conservation. And we know that we still have a long way to go. However, the future looks very promising. We are looking at improving and growing our partnership with our local communities. And this, because this will allow us to increase the land surface of the country um, under conservation. Our communities will also, also benefit from the sustainable use of this natural resource, which will then create a sense of ownership.
to these local communities. And that will, of course, result in insignificant levels of poaching and illegal trade. Our wildlife population, in the end, will increase because of this program. However, there is one thing which is actually beyond our control. For us to succeed with this program, we need to have access to export markets. Without sustainable international trade, we will not succeed with this program. If we've got nowhere to export legally and sustainably acquired wildlife products, especially from conservation hunting, then this program will fail and all of us will fail in conservation. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Hamuniela, for this uh, great example of your approach to wildlife conservation and the good news of how your wildlife is, particularly in the case of rhinos, have you have shown that they have increased. Now, last, no, sorry, before last, we have Mr. Lynch Fevrier, and he is from the beautiful island of St. Lucia in the Caribbean. He represents the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and will share with us the importance of the sustainable use of Queen Kong. Mr. Fevrier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to follow in the path of the previous speaker, but I think I maybe want to be become a partner and go across to Africa. But you all could stop by in the Caribbean, St. Lucia on, on the way across, so we can all join. Um, let me take the opportunity to thank um, the Secretary General of CITES for inviting the OECS Commission um, to, make this, to, to briefly discuss this very important project. This initiative was a, a collaboration between um, some very important partners, and it was focused on, um, I can forget the long name, but basically it was a value chain study of the Queen Conk um, and concentrated on three islands, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Grenada. And it was truly a collaborative effort between the OECS, ONGTAD, and CITES, but also importantly, the local um, fisher folks, um, the ministry is re responsible for, um, for fisheries and very importantly, the population in general. The, this study was done, like I indicated earlier, in three countries. And um, the Queen Conch, which is a large sea, um, sea mollus, is found throughout the Caribbean, um, the Gulf of Mexico, and in some parts of the Atlantic Ocean. But importantly, it takes three to five years to get to maturity but it's harvested primar primarily for the meat, also for its, its shell its, and the opercolum, which is the a hard structure which protects the, the soft parts of the, of the conch once it, it's retracted, and less commonly for pearls. Now, it is harvested um, by a Freeman crew, um, which uh, they use diving equipment and they, they actually must dive between 80 and 110 feet to be able to, um, to, to get the, the conch. Now, it is very, the, the conch meat is very important to the three countries in, in particular, but um, with each of them having different um, um, needs moving forward. SVG, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which has been a traditional ex ex exporter of conch for the past um, um, two decades, um, um, provi provides have harvested in, in the region of three million U.S. dollars in 1920 in 2020 for, for the Kong trade. It is very important for maintaining em employment in the small islands. Um, um, next related to SVG, and in particular um, the countries of um, Union Island. It is also important for the cultural value as, as, as fishers on Union Island um, have, are known as conch, as known as conch men, and there's an annual conch festival celebrating the culture and economic importance of these fisheries. St. Lucia, which has, also has a vibrant queen conch industry, is a bit different. It has a large tourism population, so therefore um, it's a net 
the user of, of, of the Queen Kong meat, which comes from the, the neighboring islands of um, Grenada and, and, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. However, um, in between 2000, 2017 and 2020, um, they, export, they imported just under one million US dollars annually in Queen Kong. Grenada, um, which has not been able to um, meet the CITES requirement for exporting Queen Kong since 2016, um, um, but has a vibrant local industry, and, and it is suspected that a lot of, of the, the conch meat that's produced in Grenada actually goes through um, I mean to send it SVG and, and St. Lucia. Uh, the, this study um, resulted in the, um, the stakeholder mapping which, which, um, and a value chain study of each of the, of this, of the three documents. However, the, this study also en enabled a, a critical look of the, of the Queen Kong value chain and, and to give a, a better understanding to, of the way forward. But it also enabled a focus on, the, on adaptive management moving forward, a better understanding of the ecosystem and, and the sustainable livelihoods um, to, uh, and to support the sustainable livelihoods of the fisher folks in particular. Um, there's also a very important element of this project, um, in, in particular the, the partnerships that, that, that was actually um, came out of it. And, 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 and also they, they were able to look at the moving forward, there must be a continued leveraging of the partnership in, and in particular continued collaboration with CITES and to deliver some, some of the actions on a scientific and factual basis um, so that we can move forward. And to firmly embark on a better path to manage this resource. Now, the, the Queen Kong, um, the plan of action that resulted from this initiative um, was, was enabled us, um, the OECS Commission, to, 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 to prioritize and, and some of the following actions are happening as we speak. Um, the, the Blue Marine Laboratory and Innovation Center, which is a fancy way to say that um, we're building a a nursery on, the, on Union Island, and the objective of the nursery would be to grow, um, well, in collaboration with all the stakeholders, in, in particular the fishers, um, baby conch um, on an island setting in collaboration with Florida Atlantic University to repopulate um, um, certain um, targeted areas in, in, the country, in, in the country's waters, in particular St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, and Grenada, and to focus on a sustainable management plan, because you may have understood that whatever happens in Grenada ends up in St. Lucia. So it, so, it, so it must be a collaborative effort to look at the, the, the Kong industry as a whole for the subregion, and not just one country in particular. And that is very important. And also very importantly, um, there will be a continued effort to support Grenada's path to compliance and, and, and to, to, to be able to, with them to, to, to effectively manage that resource moving forward, seeing that it's so important um, to the subregion. Also, um, using this um, initiative, um, this collaboration, the work is going to be exp expanded to the other OECS member states, in particular Antigua and St. Kitts, and they are, we are actively discussing that. And um, let me conclude by again thanking and recognizing the partnerships that, 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 was, that, was so, that was developed and to indicate from the point of view of the OECS that we are going to do all in our power to continue um, and this partnership and again thank um, um, the CITES SG for this, this opportunity and for the continued co um, good collaboration and cooperation that we have, the OECS has with CITES moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fevrier, and it's 
for me, this is a, a really good example of how one plus one plus one equals more than three when you put lots of partners together and how it can benefit, for example, with CITES, working at the regional level, which also has an advantage, and to be able to have one of the countries, as you mentioned, who has been under a compliance mechanism to be able to make the changes by also working together with those parties who are in compliance to be able then to change and put in the legislation that they needed to put in and continue the work that needs to be done. So a real success story also in that way. Now, last but not least, Mr. Richard Scobie. He is the Executive Director of Traffic, specialist on wildlife trade and wildlife conservation. Mr. Scobie will share with us the benefits of working in partnership on medicinal and aromatic plants in Nepal. Did you bring something nice smelling for us? Ah. <laughs> Mr. Scobie, the floor is yours. Good morning. It is an absolute honor to contribute to today's celebration to mark World Wildlife Day and, more importantly, the 50th anniversary of CITES, particularly as traffic has been a core partner from the very early days. I want to share a story about a partnership we have in Nepal involving rural communities in beautiful Himalayan mountainous areas, a very close partnership with CITES. The Nepal is the main exporting country of the wild harvested plant Jadamansi, which is known in English uh, as spikenard. John, uh, Jadamansi is, sorry, Jadamansi is the key commercially valuable species that rural communities harvest and, and export. It's been traded and used for millennia. In fact, it's one of the, the few plant species that's actually mentioned directly in the Bible. It also features on the logo of the marvelous day, which you'll see again on the screen, the beautiful flowering plant in the bottom right-hand corner. Over 15,000 people are involved in its harvest and trade, often from marginalized communities in remote mountain regions. The revenue from the trade accounts for about 25% of their annual income, so very important part of their livelihoods. Oil extracted from Jadamansi's rhizomes, sorry, oil that's ec extracted from the rhizomes of Jadamansi is used in the perfume, ar aromatherapy, and cosmetic sectors worldwide. The plant is also very important for medicinal uses. But habitat loss and overharvesting have threatened the species survival, the wider biodiversity of the mountain ecosystem, and the livelihoods of harvester communities. These threats led to Jadamansi being listed in Appendix 2 of CITE several years ago to better regulate the trade to ensure the survival and sustainable use of this critically endangered species. In 2017, the Nepali government passed new legislation to strengthen the implementation of CITES in the country. This was a welcomed demonstration of their commitment to sustainable trade. But unfortunately, the new law had the unintended consequence of banning all exports of Appendix 2 listed species, including Jadamansi, which is exactly what you're not supposed to do with Appendix 2. It encourages regulated sustainable trade. So the impact on the livelihoods and incomes of thousands of Jadamansi growing households was absolutely devastating. In response, Traffic, my organization, launched a new partnership with CITES, with the government of Nepal, and with other key organizations and stakeholders who work in Nepal in 2018. The work was funded by the US government and the UK government and helped Nepal reformulate this new legislation. Since then, we've worked in partnership 
with businesses, community forest user groups, the, the government, CITES Authority, and the Asian Network for Sustainable Agriculture uh, and Bioresources to set baselines for sustainable harvest and trade, implement a certification standard to verify sustainable management, and support the government in effectively and appropriately implementing CITES trade controls. The partnership has created a smoother, more traceable and sustainable international trade for Jadamansi with a fairer price for the harvesters. Over 10,000 hectares of forests and meadows have been brought under improved management, which have benefited over 2,000 harvesters, half of whom are women. This work has also strengthened the protection of a critical habitat in the mountains for the vulnerable snow leopard. There are plans underway to scale up the area under improved management to 25,000 hectares by 2024, benefiting an additional 5,000 harvesters. The outcome of this partnership demonstrates how CITES has evolved and succeeded over the past 50 years. Originally, CITES was perceived as a treaty, as a treaty that banned trade in endangered species. Today, CITES is recognized as a critical global tool for regulating trade and ensuring that trade is legal and sustainable. And they're always working close collaboration with a wide range of parties, stakeholders, and partners. Originally, CITES was just the two lists of species covered by the convention. Today, CITES provides its parties a rich set of tools to implement the convention ranging from monitoring tools such as the CITES trade database and the elephant trade information system to non-detriment findings that ensure that harvest will not be a detriment to the species. Most importantly, and Yvonne talked about this in her opening comments, today CITES is recognized not only for the important role it plays in regulating wildlife trade, but also for supporting the broader global biodiversity framework and tackling related critical social and environmental challenges, such as climate change, the risks of zoonotic disease transfer, the rights and livelihoods of indigenous peoples and local communities, and other key targets of the sustainable development goals. As I look into the audience today and see many friends and partners or organizations, it's great to see so many of us working closely with CITES and making a significant contribution to the partners that underpin the work of CITES. Truly, our collaboration highlights the proverb that individually we are just one drop, but together we are an ocean. May the next 50 years of CITES bring even stronger and deeper partnerships to ensure a nature positive future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Scobie. And you know, you touched upon one of my favorite themes, which is that it's not only about animals, we also take care of plants. And we have to talk a lot more about that because they also bring a lot, of course, they bring benefits to communities, they bring benefits to the world and ecosystems, right? So we also have to, and in fact, our World Wildlife Trade Report showed that the majority of trade is in plants. So we have to keep a closer look on how trade, how trade is uh, in plants and to ensure that it continues to be sustainable and that uh, local livelihoods can benefit from them. So thank you very much for that. And thanks really to all our presenters for taking us from the US to Southern Africa, to the Caribbean, and finally to Nepal with these stories of partnerships for conservation. Please join me in a big hand of applause for all of them. Thank you. It's now, so now we have more stories. It's time for video number two from the Jackson Wild Showcase. In northern Kenya, a land of beauty, towering mountains covered in lush forests, surrounded by vast and arid landscapes. It's a delicate ecosystem. 
the mountains and their forests catch the water and release it slowly to the surrounding drylands. This land belongs to Samburu pastoralists. They live alongside an abundance of wildlife. The Milgis Trust works across a 6,000 square kilometer area, helping the Samburu to conserve this landscape and improve their lives. But the fragile balance is now under threat. Temperatures are rising, droughts are getting longer and more severe. This year's was devastating. The Samburu have always dug wells in the dry riverbeds, or lagas. But it's not just they and their livestock which are thirsty. So is the wildlife. Tensions are rising. This is where wildlife, livestock, human beings uh, come for water. And as a result, there is a very high competition for the resource. People dig wells for their livestock and for their families to get water. And during the night, in the evenings, wild animals, elephants, wild dogs, hyenas, guinea falls, come and drink from the same wells and in the process they break the wells, they cover the wells again and as a result people are a bit bitter with wildlife and they chase elephants whenever they see them around here, they chase baboons whenever they see them around here and this escalates human wildlife conflict. <laughs> Desperate for water, some elephants fall into the wells and discover they can't find a way out. Freeing them from these wells is difficult and dangerous for people and traumatic for the animal. Often, it is the babies who fall in. And not all the trapped elephants can be rescued. This one died. So with the help of the Milgis Trust, the Samburu are rebuilding wells so they can be used by both livestock and elephants. The other wells are just a hole going down. So we are trying to make this with a one side flat so they can walk in and walk out. And as a result, it reduces conflict with human beings. There are also other pressures on the land. Erosion caused by overgrazing by livestock and erratic rain. The precious soil washed away. The gullies, not just in the arid lowlands, but even up on the fertile hills, are like open sores. The forests have always been a rich source of food and other materials for the Samburu. And the elders know how to use these resources and how to conserve them. But can these traditions survive? The conservation challenges are immense, with more people and livestock, commercial poaching, and increasing pollution. But there are also hopeful signs. Elephants are now more common in this landscape. A few years ago, they were never seen by day. Samburu culture is alive and resilient. The Milgis Trust works with the Samburu to improve health and water supplies, as well as reduce conflict with wildlife. Building resilience will be essential in years to come for biodiversity and so the people of this area can prosper, even in the age of climate change.
see more of these uh, with, with stories being told from those who are making a difference by working in partnership. Now, you're in, you, many of you have already seen some of the great artwork outside in the corridors that were a result of the IFAW Youth Art Competition. And those of you who are watching online, you're also in for a treat. Uh, it's time for the Youth Art Competition run by the International Fund for Animal Welfare, IFAW. And I pass over to the North America Director, Ms. Danielle Kessler, for this event that we have every year in World Wildlife Day with beautiful pictures from young people. Thank you, Secretary General. I'm honored to be here today celebrating the 50th anniversary of CITES, the 10th anniversary of World Wildlife Day, and the fifth anniversary of our International Youth Art Contest. Regrettably, our president and CEO, Azadine Downs, was unable to be here with us in person today, but you will be hearing from him shortly via video remarks. IFA is delighted to host the Youth Art Contest each year in this great partnership with the CITES Secretariat and the UN Development Program. To honor this year's theme, artists were asked to submit pieces that featured species which have benefited from people working in partnership to conserve them. And I'm so pleased to be joined today by someone much more qualified than myself to speak about how the beauty of art can inspire conservation action and provide hope to even the most challenging issues. Jim Toomey is the creator of Sherman's Lagoon, a comic strip that appears daily in more than 150 newspapers in 20 countries and is translated into six languages and has even become a high school musical. Through a lazy great white shark named Sherman and his ocean neighbors, Jim explores themes of climate, conservation, and environment in a light, apolitical way. Jim has produced several award-winning short videos for clients such as the United Nations and Pew Charitable Trust, using humor to touch on topics like ocean trash, blue carbon, and nutrient runoff. Now, over to Jim. Thank you, Danielle. A celebration of World Wildlife Day isn't complete without the wildlife, and we have some wonderful pictures of animals that we'd like to share with you. These are no ordinary pictures. We're going to show you some of the thousands, a few of the thousands of images done by children all over the world who were asked to create a work of art about wildlife for IFAW's International Youth Art Contest in partnership with CITES and the UN Development Program. Art and artist are inseparable. You cannot contemplate one without considering the other. When we think of artwork done by children, we may think of crayons and stick figures. What you're about to see are some of the purest expressions of love and awe, respect and wonder, done with a remarkable level of skill. Pablo Picasso once said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. As someone who makes a living drawing animals, I struggle with this every day. My, my adult brain is too literal, too loaded with useless information, too distracted. Children truly are the best artists. The sad fact is my career peaked when I was 12. <laughs> I had the privilege of being one of the judges in this worldwide art exhibit. Given the difficult task of picking a few favorites out of the many oil paintings, watercolors, sketches, and other artworks produced by our global art collective. The compositions, the colors, the concepts, the way they all come together to make an impression, to evoke an emotion. It's a skill that children do remarkably well. With every work of art I considered, it was clear to me how much emotion that the young artist had put into it. And I, in turn, felt the emotion behind it. That, for me, is the true measure of art. How does it make you feel? You're about to see some examples of their artwork. And when you do, you'll see that they've gotten to know their subjects extremely well. They represent every detail, their fur, their feathers, their fins, their form, with the love of a true artist. And by expressing them as art, they compel us to admire their beauty. What's also meaningful to me about this artwork is the special relationship children have with animals. They appreciate animal intelligence and, we, and they see them more as our equals in a world where all life merits respect. It's a perspective that many of us lose when we age. 
To paraphrase Picasso, we're all animal lovers when we're children. How to retain that love when we grow up. And now, it's my pleasure to present a video with IFA president and CEO, Azadine Downs, and author, actor, and mother, Alicia Silverstone, who will announce the winners. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm really pleased to greet you today on behalf of the International Fund for Animal Welfare. We have been saving the lives of animals through our work to rescue, rehabilitate and release individual animals back into natural habitats and that is our work on conservation. This year to celebrate World Wildlife Day on March 3rd, we're very happy to once again partner with CITES and the United Nations Development Program to celebrate this important day. The theme this year is partnerships in wildlife conservation. And today is an occasion just to acknowledge the importance of biodiversity and animals around the world. Sometimes I know it's very easy to get overwhelmed by all of the negative news that you hear every day in the media. But I want to leave you with a message of hope that there are things that we can do we can do them as individuals and we can save lives through organizations like IFAW. So I'm very, very happy to tell you that on this World Wildlife Day, it is our pleasure to introduce renowned actress and author and self-described kind mama, Alicia Silverstone. So Alicia, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words and warm introduction, Azadine. And hi, everyone. It's an honor to share in this event with you today and a pleasure to join IFAW, CITES, UNDP in presenting the winner of the fifth annual World Wildlife Day International Youth Art Contest. This year, the theme shines a spotlight on all those people and partnerships who are making a difference for wildlife and the natural world today.
delighted to celebrate not only this year's winner, but all of the over 1,000 entrants from nearly 90 countries across the globe. The work was so beautiful. Every single thing I saw was so beautiful. It was so hard to pick. So congratulations to every single one of you. And without further ado, I'm thrilled to announce that the winner of the 2023 International Youth Art Contest is... My name is Punisa Sosai, and a student in Yuplat Vitiarai School, Chiang Mai, Thailand. My drawing is a hornbill. It is an endangered species. In Thailand, it is very difficult to find. I choose to paint a hornbill because the hornbill is colorful and beautiful. We admire the hornbill as a symbol of love. I don't want hornbill to disappear from nature. We should help conserve hornbill to prevent extinction. I want hornbills to stay with the forest forever. Is it working now? Yes, I think now it is. Wow, impressive, 1,100 entries. Uh, hard work for the judges to go through. We also uh, pitched in there, and more than 80 countries represented. And every year I say, they put us to shame. I still work with stick figures. I imagine many of you do as well. Some of these, some of these children really are so talented. Thank you so much for that, and uh, I, I think we will be able to show you later. We are going to have a little bit of time uh, for some a drink and, and, and some food, and you can walk around and see the, the, the pictures that they have done. They're very impressive. So thank you so much for that, and thank you to IFA for continuing the partnership every year at, uh, on World Wildlife Day. World Wildlife Day is a celebration of the planet's wild animals and plants, but there no, is no denying that nature is under threat. One in eight of all animal and plant species is at risk of extinction. There is also no denying that the current levels of financing for conservation aren't enough to halt and reverse the decline in biodiversity. So where's the funding going to come from? In a moment, we will hear from expert panelists on this critical issue. But first, to set the scene, let's hear from Chris Smith, who works for an organization called Bankers Without Boundaries. They're a group of former or current investment bankers who are trying to bridge the gap between funding institutions and those working in conservation. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much to the CITES Secretariat for inviting me here to World Wildlife Day today. My name's Chris Smith. I'm a career banker. I spent 30 years in the financial markets at Standard Chartered and HSBC. Partnership and innovation are absolutely at the heart of the biodiversity conservation challenge, which is the very reason why BWB, the organization I am part of, was creative. We're a not-for-profit advisory and investment boutique. We were set up on the basis of two basic concepts. Firstly, there's a willing task force, a skill set that wants to turn itself to major social and environmental challenges. Secondly, it's not actually the availability of money it's the problem, it's the conditions needed for that money to land that is the problem. BWB sits in the interface between the public and private sectors, looking to innovate financial products to meet major social and environmental challenges. The conventional wisdom of bankers or popular culture that we are the antithesis of the conservation movement. The bank of evil in the cartoon Despicable Me is actually a parody of Lehman Brothers. Pretty ironic that three managing directors of BWB are actually former Lehman Brothers. BWB came alive on the premise 
there's a lot more in common than we realise between the public sector and the private sector and it's based on the theme of partnership and collaboration. Why is that partnership important though? The typical approach to biodiversity or nature protection is public finance. I think there will always be a reason and a case for public investment in biodiversity and nature protection. Hank Paulson from the Paulson Institute talks about the annual financing gap of what is available and what is actually needed for biodiversity protection is over $600 billion a year at least. So the question is, where's that financing coming from? In the words of Jerry Maguire, second film analogy, show me the money. All of you are very familiar with the pressure on public finances, be it government money or multilateral money. You compound that by post-COVID recovery challenges, high inflation, war and natural disaster. It makes for a very serious and challenging situation. The question is, is there a role for private sector finance? And is private sector finance ready? I think it is. I started at Standard Chartered in the climate change space 20 years ago where climate change was an investment theme and a strategy. It was new at the time. It's taken a long time to get where we are today. Based on conversations I've had with many senior people in large international banks, they know that bi the biodiversity train is coming and it's coming rapidly. They know they need to respond more quickly than they did when it comes to climate change. We cannot take 20 years to address the biodiversity nature challenge. Question therefore, can we leverage and build on the experience and expertise we got from climate change to make quicker progress on biodiversity and nature? I think we can. It's worth noting organisations like Standard Charter, where I came from, are hiring very senior position into biodiversity and nature position. So, where's the common interest between bankers and the conservation movement? Bankers see biodiversity protection and a healthy environment as fundamental to a well-functioning global economy. Conservation movements need a well-functioning global economy that values biodiversity and a healthy environment. But, as I talked about at the very beginning, which led to the creation of BWB, there is an inherent mistrust which must be broken down if we're to direct the amount of funding needed to fund the massive nature financing gap. To do that, we require innovation, it will require building trust, and very importantly, it will require acknowledgement and acceptance of that common interest. Just one last quote to leave you with, my third film analogy. This is a quote in front of you from Guido Barrera. He's a senior financier in the Italian market at Kairos Partners. He wrote a book called The Devils. He talks about financiers as modern day monks. He talks them about the guardian of the here and now for the future. Maybe that's going a little bit too far, but actually I think the whole world has changed. The city is a different place. It knows that it has these challenges to participate in. What it hasn't lost is the power of creativity, of innovation, and the drive, the drive and desire to execute. Look at that funding challenge. Without bankers' capital, it simply won't be possible to achieve environmental and biodiversity objectives. To unlock that capital will require building of trust and understanding of that common interest. I spoke earlier about innovation. A lot is happening. Just a few examples of what we're doing at Bankers Without Boundaries. We've helped devise a sovereign bond that integrates nature performance within it. We're working with the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure on nature-related data to help support better transactional decision-making. The World Bank, who I think we'll talk shortly or after, um, have uh, developed the, work, the Rhino Bond. The Rhino Bond is a very sophisticated transaction that brings outcome payers and blended finance to pay for outcomes associated with Rhino preservation and conservation. Lots of great examples, but we can do more. We need to do more. Like I've said, we can't take 20 years. But to do that requires innovation. It requires to think laterally. It needs to look at where different money can come from within the financial market to meet, uh, meet needs of different parties. It will require partnership. Most importantly, it will require a building of trust. Thanks for your time. With thanks to Chris Smith and Bankers Without Boundaries for setting the scene, but also giving us some optimism, thinking that there are solutions to our issues with financing for conservation. And now I would like to welcome my, the experts to give us some 
information on what they are doing and to make us feel even more optimistic when we leave here about the possibilities. I would like to introduce Ms. Anna Foydeya, Philanthropy and Communications Director at Amazon Conservation Association, an organization that works with communities in the Amazon to protect the rainforest and build local livelihoods. Ms. Rebecca Goodman is Director of External Affairs for the African Wildlife Foundation. Their mission is to ensure wildlife, wild lands, and local communities thrive in modern Africa. And Mr. Fei Wang from the World Bank Treasury is one of those responsible for bringing funding into the World Bank, which is then invested in development projects. Welcome. We'll have some questions. Let's start, let me start with Anna and Rebecca. Anna, first, could you give us an example that shows how your organization is innovating in conservation financing? Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for having us uh, here representing a little bit of Latin America and the Amazon rainforest. Uh, one of the key things that Amazon Conservation is doing that I think is really innovative for conservation financing is actually the model of the organization itself. Uh, we are a uh, alliance of three sister organizations in Peru, Bolivia, and the U.S. And we work to uh, with a common goal of protecting the Amazon rainforest. But really, the uh, being able to be local organizations and uh, provide that be able to be a part of the communities, um, as well as having that uh, more regional impact through our real time monitoring that we do across the Amazon throughout Brazil, uh, Colombia, and Ecuador, it really provides us a way to support organizations uh, and provide some value add. But in terms of the financing, being able to be ambassadors for these local organizations here in the US really allows us to be able to give them a, uh, opportunities for finding funding that they might not have access to when they are you know, deep in the Amazon rainforest. It's hard to get a hold of people when you're deep in the Amazon rainforest. So we are able to connect them with these funding opportunities uh, and provide a foothold in the US uh, for them to be able to do that. And our alliance of sister organizations also shares unrestricted funding, which is really important for local organizations in terms of being able to do innovation, uh, fill gaps that sometimes restricted projects won't fill, and also allow them to build their reserves and strengthen their capacities. So it's really providing that uh, strengthening that some of these local organizations really need and that funding um, ability to, to be connected to funders um, elsewhere in the world. Thank you for that, and I think that that's a really good idea of connect, being the connector, because often we receive the complaints saying, well, we need funding, but we don't know how to get it. We don't know how to approach who th those who have the funding. So this is a really good idea to be the connector between those who need it and where the funding is. Rebecca, could you give us an example? This is the first test, okay. <laughs> Great, um, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Um, let's start with the global biodiversity funding gap, which is estimated at over $700 billion. Um, the cost of conservation at this sum is unsustainable. And despite our success, climate change continues to undermine our investment. So in addition to financing the gap, we're looking to narrow that gap by repositioning conservation as a productive sector and integrating conservation into African economic development agendas. This starts with valuation. What does preserving um, land, what does maintaining wildlife in situ contribute to national economies? And so we're working with national governments to answer this question and providing a comprehensive biodiversity economy assessment to also create a blueprint for investment and map um, economic growth potential that relies on the sustainable resource base of the countries. I can give an example of our work with the Rwandan government in creating a conservation and development master plan for the Volcanoes National Park, where we're providing consultative services in the form of several feasibility studies, which are looking at um, enterprise development at the household, community, and macro scales in terms of accessing uh, export market. 
And the results of these studies will show how communities can earn income, which is uh, directly sourced from the viability of the park. And we're hoping that this is really a model that we can scale to other countries. Great, and, and this is something that I have been talking about as an economist, that at the end of the day, it is a payment for ecosystem services, isn't it? Is it, it isn't something that you think of last or you put it a project from project to project, but it's something that needs to be sustainable and recognize that nature has value and investments have to be made in it. So it, it is a resource for many of those countries who actually have a lot of biodiversity on, and are poor and need to be able to find ways in which to pay for conservation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Fei Wang. The wildlife conservation bond that we've heard a lot about it today from the very beginning of the, of the event, also known as the Rhino Bond, has been seen as a groundbreaking example that brings the financial sector to conservation in a very innovative manner. Could you tell me a bit about how it works and what the role of the World Bank has been making it happen? Sure, thank you. First of all, very uh, glad to be here. And um, a, a bit self-introduction, I, um, Fei Wang, been with World Bank Treasury for about 20 years. At the World Bank Treasury, we are responsible for raising funds through capital market to support all the project lendings the World Bank does. So every year we issue about 50 billion bonds, and those proceeds are used to support uh, projects such as uh, climate change mitigations, educations, um, biodiversity projects. Um, that the World Bank um, supports. Now, um, the Wildlife Conservation Bond, it was a bond that we issued um, in June last year. I was, I was actually part of the trade. Um, it was the first time that we were able to connect the capital market specifically to a biodiversity, um, actually two projects, um, the, the projects done at the two parks in South Africa. And, um, the bond is a five-year bond issued by IBRD, by the World Bank, uh, which we call uh, IBRD, 150 million principal size. Um, the issuance proceeds, the 150 million, still comes to IBRD, the World Bank, supporting our general lending pool, the development programs that we do. Uh, what's unique about the bond is that typically we issue bond where we pay investors interest over time. Every six months or so, we pay them a certain interest. In this case, uh, investors agree to give up all that interest. At the time, it's about 10 million US dollar equivalent, given the interest rate um, this time last year. That 10 million interest that the investor given up are then going to the two parks in South Africa for the purpose of the biodiversity program that it, they, uh, they plan to implement. And um, in, return, um, in return, what will happen is that uh, if the program becomes successful at the end of five years, um, Global Environment Facility, Jeff, um, is going to pay a success payment um, that success is measured by the rhino growth rates just because rhino is the keystone animal there. But but a, but a project is going to bring social benefits because it's not just the biodiversity, it's not just the, the growth of the rhinos, it's, it's the thriving parks that brings the tourism revenues, bring a sustainable development for everybody there. But if the program is successful at the end of the day, Jeff is, is going to pay about $14 million success fee that $14, $14 million will go back to the investors. So from the investors' perspective, they give up about $10 million regular interest they would otherwise make from the, um, the regular World Bank bond in return for a chance to make $14 million. And that way, the project actually received $10 million upfront financing from the, uh, from the pre uh, private sector. And that there's no need for South Africa government or the parks to pay back. It's not a loan to them. They basically get to use the $10 million um, as, a as a grant. Um, so that's, that's what's unique about the bond. I mean, it's the first time that we were able to connect specifically capital market uh, in this way so that private sector provide upfront financing to support specific biodiversity projects. And we're very excited about it and uh, certainly looking forward uh, to scale up um, things like this in the future. That's fantastic. And I think, in fact, that that's, we have to keep our eye on this and see the outcomes because uh, it would be wonderful to be able to scale it up and to be able to, to work on other different types of species uh, that need uh, this kind of uh, support from the private sector as well uh, for their conservation. So we'll, we'll be looking towards uh, being able to scale it up and, and widening the coverage. 
Um, Anne and Rebecca, in the video from Bankers Without Boundaries, we heard that the availability of money is not the problem, but rather it's the conditionality of the funds that is the challenge. Do you agree with that? What are some of the conditions you have observed as being challenging from your point of view? Rebecca? Um, well, in short, I do agree. I think conservation is inherently a risky business. Um, the long time horizons for realizing impact and return on investment, I think, are ultimately unattractive to investors. Um, in the public sector context, accountability is paramount. And the ODA community is, is making increased efforts to drive financing to the ground um, at the local levels, um, specifically through USAID's new localization policy. Um, but there remain challenges, and I think the often cited limitation is the financial management capacity of those local organizations. So the African Wildlife Foundation is actually working to, well, let me say, typically what happens is that large conservation organizations end up being the prime awardees of the funds, uh, and then re-grant to local partner organizations who you know, tend to be in this role of service provider. So what we're trying to do is shift that partnership paradigm and really um, build and strengthen the capacity of African institutions to assume leadership roles in the implementation and delivery of conservation. Fantastic, really, the need to be able to build capacity there on the ground and to be able to manage the funds themselves. That's wonderful. Anna. Yes, I definitely echo everything that Rebecca has said that is definitely happening in the uh, Amazon rainforest as well when it, terms, when it comes to two, the two main issues that we see. Uh, the biggest challenge is definitely that indigenous groups and local organizations are not getting the direct funding that they need uh, and also not a lot of unrestricted funding that would allow them to build some of that capacity, to build some of that reserves. They need to be able to strengthen themselves. Um, and then the grants that they do receive, they are very limited in um, size and scope and how they can actually spend that funding. And a lot of the times, uh, because of their size as an organization being small local organizations, it also limits the, uh, them being able to be in the conversation about protecting the habitats that they actually live in and actually work every day to protect. Uh, so they are the ones feeling the most of the impact of climate change, and I think exactly like Rebecca had mentioned, uh, it's really important that we give them, um, and I think the, the media um, representative also mentioned in her slides, uh, making sure that there is uh, ownership uh, locally, that these projects are the ones that are uh, being led by the local organizations. It's not just that paternalistic cycle of providing funding by um, big organizations uh, and then they leave at the end of the day as well. We need to make sure that we are building that sustainability at the end of the day because the local people are really the ones that are going to be there for the long term and that's what we want to see and that's why we want to support especially at um, Amazon Conservation. And I think the capacity issue really cannot be understated. It's really difficult for these small organizations and indigenous groups to manage large complex funding, especially for example funding from the US government. Um, so it's really important that we help build the basic capacity, basic management, finances, and operations so they are able to also manage these funds themselves and really be the leaders in their own conservation uh, efforts. Great. And yes, absolutely. Build capacity. And I think it, it, at the end of the day, it's also about accountability, isn't it? Because you have to build trust between those who are providing the funds and those who are receiving it. And I think with that building of capacity where they can manage it better, that's going to be go a long way in building that trust. Uh, Fei Wang, from your experience, what do you see are the challenges of conditionality that the beneficiary countries and partners often face in connecting investors closely with SDG projects or initiatives? Yeah, I mean, from, the, um, from our perspective, um, instead of conditionality, I actually, uh, I think perhaps it's better to talk about what are the elements that make a project uh, suitable for transaction with the uh, private sector. Um, because at the end of the day, it is, it is important to have the, the transparency about um, what is the goal um, 
as the investors are getting very sophisticated now, um, those that participated in the Rhino bond or the other SDG bond that we issue obviously are not just looking for financial return. They want to see the, f um, the social benefit of their associated with their investment. So a very clear communication of how the money is going to be spent and what is the what is the really the end goal and the social um, benefit of that particular project is very important to communicate to investors upfront. Um, also, um, there's a clear um, sort of a clear track record of the capability of the entity to manage a project. That is also important because eventually we're talking about a financial instrument that the payback investors depending on the performance of the project. So if the project does not perform, investor would suffer a financial loss. So, so that track record of the capability, it's important. It's something that gives investors the confidence that they put the money in, the money is going to be put into good use relatively quickly and efficiently and, gener and, and very likely to generate uh, the result. So that track record is important. And then the measurement of the progress of the, of the project. It's also important to show investor the progress, but also that helps, um, in my view, the management entity to know that what has been working or what's not working, so that they can also make adjustment on time, so that uh, in the case of Rhino Bond, at the end of the day, hopefully, um, they can still navigate the program toward uh, toward a success um, success ending. So, so to us, it's more about. Um, ability to show the track record, to give investors the confidence for them to participate, and, and, and a clear subjective measurement of the, the progress. That is the important element um, to support a financial transaction with private sectors. It's interesting because some of, some of the things of using, the ways of using public funds and using private funds are similar when you talk about monitoring and, and making changes if needed and indicators to be able to show progress. But at the same time, there are some differences in terms of wanting to have something, confidence and you're going to have some return for your investment, which is different with the private sector. So we have to keep that in mind that there are going to be some things that are similar, but some things that are different and we, that's what we have to learn. So finally, Anna, platforms like the Amazon Conservation Association works on bringing the socioeconomic development dimension in your work. How do you ensure the support for local communities go hand in hand with wildlife conservation uh, targets? It's really about empowering people to become champions for nature and to protect the forest home of the wildlife. So we do that in three different ways. The first way is we are uh, supporting local communities to really take full advantage of the forest sustainable uh, uh, economic potential. And we do that by building a uh, uh, a forest-based economy in the southwest Amazon of Peru and Bolivia, uh, which is one of the most productive areas of the entire Amazon rainforest. Uh, and we help build and strengthen the local people's sustainable livelihoods, especially the ones focused on forest goods that are uh, only can be harvested, for example, in sustainable, in healthy forests. So that includes acai berries, uh, Brazil nuts, maho, and other types of, of local products. So ensuring that there is some diversification and in their sustainable livelihoods uh, allows them to have a greater income and also because these uh, specific forest goods can only be produced in uh, forest uh, healthy forests that also encourages them to ensure that there is a healthy habitat for not only their sustainable uh, livelihoods but also for the animals that live there the second way that we are uh, supporting uh, both wildlife and uh, human uh, conservation efforts is really to empower the local forest users and especially indigenous peoples to uh, protect their lands resources and rights uh, especially using the the technology uh, that is available out there uh, so we have a monitoring program called map that is the monitoring of the Andean Amazon project and it uses uh, satellite-based technology to be able to uh, 
uh, find deforestation and fires in real time across anywhere, any point in the Amazon. So, and that information is provided to local communities and to local governments, so they can take action before that deforestation gets to that point of no return. So, in doing that, we are really empowering the local communities to protect those habitats, ensure that there is no encroachment and deforestation that actually will uh, allow the animals to be able to have free range throughout the um, throughout their habitat. And then lastly, uh, we know that, and we saw in some of the video examples, that there's always bound to be wildlife conflicts with humans when we are coexisting together in the same forest. So what we, we do with that is we are training the next generation of conservationists to really understand and mitigate some of these uh, misconceptions that there are about around animals. So for example, in Bolivia, we um, have worked directly with children and park rangers to really uh, this dissipate some of the uh, the misconceptions that there were around jaguars and jaguar attached to their livestock. So we were able to do educational programs, do some of the art contests uh, similar to what IFA is doing as well, uh, and really get the community engaged in how they can mitigate some of these conflicts. And at the end of the project, of over 400 people participated, and the vast majority said that they will actually, instead of trying to kill a jaguar when they when they see one, when they have an encounter, they will actually leave it alone because they know that it's an endangered species now. So that's a, a big win for, for conservation. Excellent. I think two points there. Uh, the issue of coexistence, coexistence is now a really a priority for many countries, uh, especially with populations of animals growing. And the other issue is incentives for those communities to protect those habitats and protect those species that they're living next to in order, because the biggest fear, again, is land conversion and destruction of the habitat, so that's excellent work. Rebecca, we hear that while large international NGOs may already have experience in talking to donors and investors, but many smaller local organizations may not know where to start. What do platforms like the African Wildlife Foundation do to help build the partnerships that they need? So firstly, we believe that the decisions around when, how, where to invest in conservation need to lie with the cost bearers of those decisions. And so the people-centered approach to conservation is really at the heart of our work. Um, we're working to mobilize African-led um, platforms to engage in global dialogues and bring African perspectives to the table. One of those is called the Africa CSO's Biodiversity Alliance, of, or ACBA. And it's a network of over 100 member organizations from across the continent who together have defined a common agenda for how to inform and influence policy and practice on the continent. Um, together, the, the network enables them to uh, um, collaborate on common interests and bring that common action plan to donors. Um, and provides an entry point for donors to then support the activities that are coming from that. And so it's, it's almost like a one-stop shop um, where donors are then gaining access to this broad network um, that's across the continent um, as a means to scale activities um, and, and kind of reach that next level. So we've had a lot of success with that and we have a number of those platforms kind of working in different areas um, with Africa Protected areas directors, with youth, um, with journalists, uh, through our Media Labs project. Um, and in that way, we are really um, create, catalyzing African ownership. Great, and I like you, we're using the word dialogue, <laughs> which I'm looking forward in the next 50 years of CITES to see much more dialogue, because I think we, everybody needs to sit around the table. And, uh, and discuss their issues openly. Fei Wang, and looking forward finally, what would international development banks like the World Bank could do to address the conservation financing gap? And how would that contrast to other financing entities like private sector for-profit banks or pension funds? What could be the different roles they could play in complementing each other? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think that the traditional funding for the, for the conservation for the uh, biodiversity donations and funding from MDBs and organizations that definitely should continue. The, the private sector is meant to be a supplemental a funding source for that and not to replace that all completely. Um, now, in addition to the regular funding 
uh, what we're hoping at Treasury, what we're hoping to see is that um, there's a way to engage private sector to provide financing to projects that are in a way bankable that way, um, that is suitable to get funding through the investors uh, like the way that uh, the Rhino Bond worked. So that's where I feel that there's a lot of things the other organization could do, the other organization being the other issuers in the MDB space like us. Um, obviously the financial intermediaries, the investors. And, and to that end, um, the Rhino Bond was done last year and people in the market today still talk about it. That's a, that's actually a very good sign because usually uh, capital market transactions, they happen very fast and afterwards sort of the, all the glory dies down, people move on to the next thing. So, so, so there's a lot of attention from the private sectors because um, the ESG investing has, has moved along. A lot of investors are getting very sophisticated. They no longer are, are uh, happy just with investing in general ESG investment. They want to see specifically where their money has gone to. They want to see the specific connection of their investment with a project. So um, certainly there is that attention an environment from the private sector, um, but but for the the kind of the bond, um, the private sector mobilization transactions to take place, it needs wider participation from the other issuers. Um, MDBs in general, uh, is the natural issuers for this kind of the transactions because uh, because number one, they know the development need, they know what is the benefit, you know how these projects typically are managed. So. They know, they know that. At the same time, MDBs uh, do issue bonds in capital market in large size. So there's a lot of investors putting money with the MDBs. So, so they naturally play the natural connection point between the private sector um, and um, a development program such as biodiversity project. So that's where uh, we're hoping that um, more people, more issuers will follow suit, will think about what they can do, what kind of the financial instrument they can bring to the market. And whatever we did last year, the Rhino Bond, I mean, it's only the beginning. It's not meant to be a cookie cutter approach. Everybody just copy paste the exact uh, structure. It's, it's the starting point for people to think about given what they're doing in the financial market, what is it that they can design to facilitate, bring funding from capital market, from private sector to support a, a sustainable development project. Indeed, one size doesn't fit all, and we'll have to look at this in the future. And I'm really so appreciative of you coming to share your views on opportunities and challenges for the future when we're looking now at more sustainable financing, but also bringing in the private sector for conservation purposes uh, in the next 50 years. Hopefully, we'll see lots of changes and in innovation. Please help me have a round of applause. <laughs> So we can see that funding is one vital element in conservation, but even more important than funding are people. The current generation doing everything they can to push sustainability and those of the next generation on their way up. In this next section, we will hear from two young people who have helped build a youth network from the ground up. They sacrificed participating in their own World Wildlife Day event in Singapore an event which is bringing together hundreds of young people from all the countries of Southeast Asia to bring a message for you. But before we hear from them, we can see something of the work of the young filmmakers that Jackson Wild is showcasing this year.
wow, those film teasers were so captivating. My name is Steffi, and I'm from Singapore. And I'm Nabila from Malaysia. Good morning to CIT Secretary General, Your Excellencies, and all our distinguished guests and speakers who are present with us today, and to everyone who is tuning in online. Nabila and I were both inspired by David Attenborough and Steve Irwin when we were growing up, and it's quite amazing to see how our generation is stepping up to produce films that inspire others too. Today, we'd like to share with you our partnership stories as youth in Southeast Asia and what we've learned along the way. So my story begins when I did an internship with the National Parks Board. They are also known as NParks, and they are the Scientific and Management Authority of CITES in Singapore. Seeing how Singapore and Malaysia worked on the successful uplisting of songbirds at COP19 and how that led to other collaborative projects, I realized that partnerships begin with simple conversations and are made stronger through good relations and trust. I wanted to create a platform for youths in Southeast Asia to have these conversations and to connect as well. And so I joined the World Wildlife Day planning team for the Regional Youth Symposium, which was initiated by NPARKS. And as we speak, my friends just wrapped up the first day of our event, and we invite you to join us through the live stream, which will begin later tonight. It is a rare opportunity for youth in Southeast Asia to work closely with the government to realize and plan their own initiative. Our vision is to build a regional community of youths and mentors who are connected in their common goal for biodiversity conservation, while vibrantly diverse in their cultures, backgrounds, and strengths and I'm very proud of how we youths have brought people together. Over this weekend, 200 youths from all 10 ASEAN member states will gather in Singapore to learn from conservation mentors from the region, connect and build genuine friendships and bonds. Regional representation is very important to us because we wanted youths to be able to relate to mentors of similar nationalities, backgrounds and gender, and feel inspired to realize their own potential too. In line with this year's theme for World Wildlife Day, we have partnered with 24 organizations, ranging from individuals, youth groups, intergovernmental organizations, and international NGOs to create talks, panel discussions, and workshops. With so many people from so many different backgrounds, can you imagine the interactions and stories that will be shared? I believe that the broader perspectives and new friendships that our youth will return home with will sow the seeds for future partnerships when they arrive at decision-making positions or even now in the initiatives that we undertake. We've learned a lot from this process and we invite you to join us as partners to make Nexus One even bigger or to create your own event that empowers youth with the trust, support and financial resources to drive the impact that they wish to see. Our mentor took a big step of trust when she agreed to, hold, agreed to our proposal for a physical symposium with such a large and regional scale. We were convinced that this was the best way to nurture our community that we envision. And with this strong vision, we also want the support of all our partners, and Bandai Nature stepped in to fund our logistics needs and provide financial assistance for regional participation. We are grateful that our presence and voice were valued by leaders and mentors. We were so inspired when Secretary General, Ms. Yvonne Egaro, spent an afternoon to talk to us about partnerships when she visited Singapore despite her busy and packed schedule. And we're incredibly pumped that Dr. Adrian Liu, sorry, that Dr. Adrian Liu, head of delegation at COP19, agreed to form a World Wildlife Day ban with us. <laughs> and so, driven by, 16, driven by 16 chaotic youth volunteers, as you can see, and standing on the shoulders of all our partners and our mentors who believed in us and supported us. The story of our symposium showcases the tenacity, capability, and ambition of youth. If given the support and resources to contribute, we can do great and difficult things, and we can make a difference. And it's looking beyond this symposium, our ability to bring everyone from all walks of life together can bring fresh social cultural perspectives that can shape better decision making. And it's not only what youth can bring to the table when we are included, it's also what we can bring back to our communities. This is my friend Waikit, and his Instagram stories as a youth delegate at COP19 made the technical proceedings more accessible to me and 500 others. 
So youths have their own unique ways of raising awareness and we can be effective partners in conservation. And that is also why the recognition of youths and their effective participation in the CITES Youth Network is so important, and I'm really excited for it. So to end, youths in Southeast Asia and all around the world are ready and able to contribute, to contribute towards a sustainable, just, and diverse future. As we recognize the importance of partnerships for wildlife conservation this year, are you ready to partner us for a better future? Thank you. This is a teaser to our music video. Come closer now. But I'll pass the time now to Nabila to share her journey as a young conservationist in Malaysia. All right. <laughs> so thank you, Steffi. Assalamualaikum and very good day to everyone. So I'm Nabila from Sarawak and I pursued my studies in zoology, majoring in mammal taxa. So this is me. And yes, Steffi, <laughs> true that I too grew up watching Steve Irwin, the greatest crocodile hunter, every Tuesday night. I have always been inspired by him as he is one of the most passionate wildlife conservationists that the world and I have ever known. Watching the TV program with my family every week made me feel like working with wildlife is my true calling. In fact, it was the trigger for me to pursue my studies in zoology. So, at 22, as a student of zoology, I started working on a project on conservation of flying fox because their numbers are thought to be inclined. And so, I'm glad to share with you all, just last year, my research paper was uh, published in the Journal of Tecton Taxa. Thank you. In this project, I worked closely with the native community in Sra of Sarawak. There, I found that flying fox are perceived as pests and were hunted as source of food. Other than that, flying fox has no economic benefit to the local communities. The people claim that vet bats are vermin, which are disease carrier or as building and crops destroyer, but it is either false or exaggerated because bats rarely cause severe health problems to humans. Do you know that in Malaysia, flame fox are an important species ecologically as they are the major pollinators and seed dispersants of many forest plants. They are also listed in Appendix 2 of CITES. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason I am sharing my experience that I gained from my study is because it really opened my eyes on how a particular species or wildlife that is so important to us can easily be misunderstood. Without proper information and awareness, the flying fox can be wiped out in certain localities. Through this research, I learned that it is important for us to spread scientific, scientifically backed information and awareness on conserving wildlife through partnership with the local community. Conservation knowledge should be translated into information that can be digested easily and not only be kept within the researchers. And realizing the importance of creating conservation awareness, I slowly started volunteering in areas of conservation by sharing knowledge to the local community. Being a part of my university World Wildlife Day campaign, it gave me great satisfaction to see young people like me who shared my interests come together. During my internship at Sabah Wildlife Department under Wildlife Rescue Unit, I had the opportunity to meet youth from all over the world who are just as passionate as me, if not more, in being at the forefront of conservation and the preservation of wildlife. Through our shared experience and conversation, I gained a deeper meaning of the conservation efforts on a global scale. Overall, my time at Sabah Wildlife Department was a formative experience that solidified my passion for conservation and commitment to making a positive impact on the environment. And like a dream came true, just exactly three months ago, I was given the opportunity to serve the nation as a part of policy making related to conservation work. I see that there are a lot of opportunities out there 
even though I have just started in this kind of work. And I would like to see more youth like me to participate in conservation work, whether it ends up becoming your career or not. Keep doing what you love and be the voice of the voiceless creature. And with that, we thank you. Thank you, Nabila and Steffi. I had the pleasure, as you saw, to visit Singapore last year, and I have never been more inspired with these than with these young people. And we have to listen to their voices. We have to include them in the conversation. And we're going to do just that at CITES. We have now started, we have just launched our youth network. So hopefully we will have a large group of youth participating in three years' time at the next COP. Thank you so much. Yes. So now as we are coming to the end, we will now see and hear more about these inspiring wildlife films and filmmakers as we move to the Jackson Wild Showcase. The earth takes care of us, so we have to do the same. We can't just let it go by. We even have a word nature, as if nature is separate from humanity. We don't exist independently of nature. We are nature. Everyone, I'm Lisa Samford, Executive Director of Jackson Wild, and I have to say I'm so happy to be here with you again, Secretary General. I think this is like seven years we've been partnering to do this. Well, at least seven years the overall with overall, World Wildlife Day, but we've it. been doing it for five years now. Yeah, it's kind of cool. We are so happy to share with you and celebrate the outstanding films that were selected as part of this year's World Wildlife Day Film Showcase. These films highlight some of the many inspiring conservation heroes out there, but also of species that continue to be in peril. Almost all effective conservation efforts rely on cooperation, and these films showcase the importance of individuals and groups working together to safeguard the future of species currently threatened with extinction and to secure a healthier planet for all. These are stories, great stories, that capture the inspiration and encouragement to all of us who work for the conservation of wildlife and the restoration of ecosystems. You nailed it. It's so <laughs> true. Um, stories connect us in, in a world that's become increasingly disconnected and isolated over the last several years. Stories can bring us closer as well as ignite the spirit of sustainability and conservation in new audiences. One thing that truly stood out to us, and you've seen it this afternoon, um, is the power of youth. Uh, youth taking action, youth seizing, seizing their own power, their own voices, and inspiring, uh, inspiring their communities, their peers, and people in power. We've got a lot, of, a lot to learn from them. They're change makers who are using media and storytelling to be loud, to take action, make a difference. 
These films and this showcase will help us drive home the importance of collaboration at all levels, from international partnerships to local communities working together. They share the experience of individuals and groups working to change our relationship with nature, to make it better, to steer us away from unsustainable practices that threaten species and lead to ecosystem degradation. Our hope is that these stories can show viewers everywhere that despite the immense challenges we face, there are ongoing efforts and successful models to look to as we seek to build a more sustainable future. This year we had over 200 entries from all over the planet, 77 countries, uh, more than 100 judges screened and reviewed, ranked. Uh, 800 plus hours to be able to come up with this, this year's showcase My staff selection. can testify to that. I know. <laughs> loads of hours. Um, so let's just jump right in and, and look at some of the clips. You've seen a few of the shorter films, but um, some of, I mean, a couple of these films were 100 minutes long, so, oh. yeah. Um, long films. No, you You're won't You're not going to see them today. <laughs> we will not keep you here that long. Uh, anyway, let's just look at uh, the compilation of clips. We call this area Kai Hayade, Shimmering Waters. This is our home. Just like it's the home to the deer, the frogs, and the panther, this is our home. This is our water. Without water, we cannot live. And when someone tries to take that away from you, you fight for it. Populations of cotton top tamarins, healthy forest, interconnected, and living in harmony with local communities. It's a whole ecosystem that we're saving when we're saving cotton top tamarins. Once I saw nothing was out to get me, I started noticing the beauty our ocean had. Why hasn't anyone brought me to do this before? They were never people who looked like me. And so I always thought that conservation was for someone else. That it's somebody from very far away that will come and be the hero. My grandfather, in the 1950s, he was planting trees. And even now, his forest is still there. I say continue looking in that forest. Whatever you 
built on a lot. The first question is always how many are alive? A natureza é, tem importância do infinito. É o pulsar que está dentro de mim. official team of scientists who entered, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what species of plants we would find and we didn't know what species of animals we would find. These small species have one chance to be recognized. These creatures give us the chance to play to save these places. So, as you can see, it's a pretty remarkable lineup, and they're available to be streamed for, um, for free educational screenings, thank you to the filmmakers, as well as some of them for um, live events, live in-person events. Um, first of all, I just, you know, as we're closing up, I want to recognize the filmmakers who are in the audience. Please stand, anybody who was involved with any of those showcase films, so that we can honor you. Thank you, and judges too. We appreciate you, judges. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to draw attention to the high school students who, from Tennessee who've come here who participated in those conservation projects and documented them. Please give a, give a stand, let us, let us know who you are. Speaking of young people and all they can do. And every year we do this, Lisa, I'm more at each time happier that we can do this together. This partnership is fantastic and so inspiring to, to show these stories, to tell these stories that are so important for wildlife conservation. And new this year we have a bit of a surprise is the Audience Award, voted on by you, the viewers. Vote on your favorite films in the showcase and the winning filmmaker will receive a free pass to this year's Jackson Wild Summit taking place this September in Grand Teton National Park. And remember, these conversations cannot end here today. We cannot just be advocates for change, we must be catalysts. The work that these filmmakers have put into their projects shows a tremendous amount of initiative, and in many cases, courage. Let this be an inspiration to us all. We can't wait for next year. We're looking forward to the audience award and to welcome them in Grand Teton. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jackson Wild. You stay here. She escaped. Okay. <laughs> we have been, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, and it brings us nearly to the end of this event. I want to ask David, we've been watched online also. Do we know how many people have? Several thousand of people watching us online, so this has an impact all over the world, doesn't it? We are very fortunate as well to have closing remarks from the United States Assistant Secretary 
of State for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. She's also the Special Envoy for Biodiversity and Water Resources, the Honorable Monica Medina. She kindly joined us in Panama for COP19 and graciously provided us with this video as I think she's back in Panama for the Our Oceans Conference, isn't she? So she was very happily and very much proud to be participating in this event as well through this video. Happy World Wildlife Day, everyone. It's especially happy because this year we celebrate 50 years of CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. I am so sorry I can't be with you in person today. I'm certainly there in spirit. Today I'm speaking to you from the State Department, which has an important connection to CITES. It was here in this building that countries came together and agreed on the final text of CITES. It was a real victory for diplomacy and U.S. leadership on conservation. CITES also shares its anniversary with the Endangered Species Act. And interestingly, the Aleutian cackling goose was one of the first species protected under both. And here's the best news. In 2019, the cackling goose was delisted. This story makes my <laughs> simple message clear. CITES works. Fifty years later, CITES protects almost 40,000 species against overexploitation through international trade. U.S. diplomats have and will continue to work to protect elephants, rhinos, tigers, sharks, and all the other non-charismatic threatened species of plants and animals that need our protection. We know that CITES is not a magic wand or a silver bullet, but it works because of you. And it is built on sound scientific analyses, commitment, and a lot of hard work. We all know about the work to protect elephants, rhinos, sharks, and tigers over the past few years. And CITES has helped us to do just that. Although they remain under threat, there would be far fewer of these iconic species in the wild had CITES not existed. Sadly, there are even more threats to biodiversity and to specific species today than when CITES entered into force. But CITES parties have responded. So many species are under threat, sharks, rare trees, corals, and this treaty is more important than ever in protecting them and it is one the U.S. takes very seriously. Let me share a few of the recent successes and the ongoing work of our State Department and other partners to combat wildlife trafficking and protect our world's wild fauna and flora. It's a whole of government effort. Our U.S. Wildlife Trafficking Task Force implements the U.S. National Strategy for Combating Wildlife Trafficking and leverages the expertise and programs of 17 federal agencies. The task force targets the most pressing wildlife concerns, such as financial crimes associated with wildlife trafficking, by building capacity and expertise for financial investigations. We work closely with international partners. For example, we're working with the government of Norway and the World Resources Institute on a new nature crime alliance. It aims to catalyze political will, foster financial commitments, and build operational capacity to fight nature crimes. And finally, we are continuing to grow the Illegal, Unreported, and Unregulated Fishing Action Alliance. We're adding new members, so please join us. And through the alliance, we're bringing greater transparency to fishing vessels on the water and to seafood supply chains. As we reflect on the last 50 years, we can be proud of the U.S. commitment to CITES and what we have accomplished together. CITES and our shared commitments and efforts have made a difference. Looking ahead to 2030 and achieving the global biodiversity framework, our work will be even more important. We cannot let a sixth wave of extinctions occur. And thanks to CITES, we have a potent tool for ensuring that it does not. 
So happy anniversary, CITES and Endangered Species Act. Happy World Wildlife Day to everyone. We're looking forward to the next 50 years of biodiversity conservation. Our warm thanks to the Assistant Secretary General and Special Envoy as we thank the United States government for hosting us here today in your capital and CITES birthplace and also for your commitment to CITES for the past 50 years. I would like to thank also the representatives of other CITES parties who have been here today for your commitment and determination to safeguard the viability of wild animals and plants for the benefit of humankind and future generations you the parties, you the partners, you the youth. Make me optimistic for the next 50 years. We have the solutions in our hands and we all, need, all we need is the political will and transformative action to fully implement our convention. On behalf of the United Nations, thanks to all of you who are here with us and to all those watching, wherever you are, know that you can make a difference acting in partnership. We will succeed in building a new and better relationship with nature. If you want to know more about how you can be involved, the World Wildlife Day website is www.wildlifeday.org. We now leave you with one last treat. You will see people setting up seats and bringing in drums, hopefully. I don't see them yet. You'll see why in a moment. And this is the Lee Montessori Public Charter School in Washington, DC. They will be playing and singing two songs for you, which are straight out of Africa, but with a healthy dose of DC in there too. I think though, we, we had to keep them a little entertained, I think, okay. <laughs> it, it would be hard, yes for kids to be listening to all of this all day long. So the celebrations for CITES 50th will continue through the year. Follow us on social media for details of more events to come. In the meantime, I leave you with the children of the Lee Montessori Public School and their teacher, Ms. Arant. Yes. I'll take advantage of, of this time to welcome you to a little opportunity to mingle and chat and catch up. After the children are finished singing, we will have some drinks and some food for you. In the cafeteria, I think it is. David, is it in the cafeteria where we have the drinks? We will have, the, we will have a little bit of a celebration in a few, after the children sing in a few minutes. So don't leave so we can all catch up.
I think we're also hoping for some audience encouragement, aren't we? <laughs> Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I think they're expecting us. Bravery, equity, grace, joy, and growth. Creativity, inclusiveness, community.
Thanks so much to Lee Montessori Public Charter School. That was fantastic. Please, let's give them another round of applause. So much energy to inspire us on World Wildlife Day. Happy World Wildlife Day, everyone. Please join us in the cafeteria. Let's have a drink and chat. Thank you. Thanks to all of you.